I'm going to be talking about something that here in Florida has actually been going on. It's going on its fifth year um, of this disease event. Um, so it, it's something that we're still trying to wrap our, our minds around as well as try to figure out what we're supposed to do about it. Um, so a little bit of background about the Florida Reef Tract. Um, it is the fourth largest uh, reef system in the world. And it does actually run from the St. Lucie Inlet up here, all the way down through Broward County, Miami County, through the Florida Keys and out to the Dry Tortugas. So that's what's considered the Florida Reef Tract. Um, it's about 221 miles long, and it contain 45 species of Caribbean coral. Um, coral important for a lot of different reasons. Um, mostly, they do provide and create habitat for a lot of organisms um, in the ocean. About 85% of all fish species actually utilize reef systems at some point in their life. So whether it's nursery habitat or areas where they find food, um, they're very, it, reefs serve a very important habitat as well as nutritional part of a lot of different organisms' lives. Uh, coral reefs are important for coastal protection. If you can see here in this picture, um, there's lots of wave action here. And as it hits these shallow reefs, it actually decreases the amount of wave action or the strength of those waves so that once it does hit the actual coast, we're seeing a lot, a lot lower wave action. Um, in some studies, they can actually see that these reef systems can decrease wave action by about 50%. Uh, corals also provide sand for beaches, um, building materials, most of the limestone that's actually quarried here in Florida were old reef systems. Uh, important for fisheries, most of the commercial and recreational fisheries here in Florida utilize reef systems in one way or another. Uh, lots of uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals are developed from organisms found on reefs, and then we all know that tourism here in Florida is also very important. Um, the total estimated value of global uh, goods and services from our reefs is $45 billion a year. However, uh, global coral cover in some areas has declined by up to 95%. So we're seeing reefs back in the 70s that were very, very healthy. This is a, a photo series from a reef in uh, the Upper Keys over near Key Largo called Carey's Fort Reef. So back in the 70s is when we kind of consider when reefs were still healthy. There wasn't a lot of degradation at that point. And you can see these nice, healthy Acropora palmata stands. And then over time, you can see this degradation so that now in 2014, this picture is from 2014, you can actually see that there is no structure. There's no living coral. There's a couple of little uh, sea fans growing and some sponges. But other than that, this reef has actually been completely and totally degraded. These graphs are some examples of uh, global examples of the decline of these reef systems. Um, over here, this is you know kind of a, an overall global view of the decline of reefs. So back when we were starting in 1975 with about 60% to 65% coral cover, now here in, I believe this is actually 2003 uh, by Gardner, we're actually seeing global coral cover. We're talking about all cover around the world is down about 10%. Um, so just in that short amount of time, we've lost a, a significant portion of coral cover. Here in the Florida Keys, well, not here in the Florida Keys, but in the Florida Keys, this is data from our crimp monitoring over at FWC. If you follow this yellow line, back in 96, we were up about 12.5%. And now over here in 2017, we're down to about 6%. Um, here in the Great Barrier Reef, again, we're seeing these declines. We just, that's basically the word that I use the most, is just these coral reefs are declining. So what's causing all of that decline? This is uh, a slide. This is my doom and gloom slide. This is basically everything that could happen on a coral reef, all in one slide. Um, so again, back in the good old days, the 1970s, the 60s, things like that, we're seeing you know, healthy coral populations. 
and then things start to go wrong. So from a Caribbean standpoint, one of the major things that happened back in the 80s was a die-off of uh, the long-spined sea urchin, diadema. Along with that die-off, we also had one of the first major disease events in the Caribbean called white plague disease. Um, that disease primarily affected the uh, elkhorn and staghorn corals, but also affected some of the major reef building corals, some of the massive species as well. Around that same time, we also saw a boom in coastal development. We saw a rapid increase in the number of people living near the reefs. We also saw a boom in the number of fisheries happening here in the Caribbean. So as we keep going down this line, one of the next major events was a global bleaching event in 1992 and 1993, along with, here in Florida, Hurricane Andrew. So Hurricane Andrew was a Category 5 hurricane, went right through Miami and actually caused quite a bit of damage to these reefs in the area. As we keep going along, now we're in 1997-98, another global bleaching event happens only five years later. And we're also then becoming aware of a lot of other types of issues happening to our coral reefs. We're seeing the effects of climate change and ocean, ocean acidification. Uh, again, we're increasing the demand on fisheries. And with the removal of a lot of those fish, we're seeing an increase in the populations of coral predators. So things like damselfish or other invertebrates like snails and fireworms, we're seeing an increase in those numbers of predators and again, continuing to decrease the amount of live coral. 2005, yet again, another global bleaching event. In 2010 in Florida, does anybody remember that cold water event where it got super, super cold? Uh, surveying some of the reefs, the water was 54 degrees in Miami. Um, so it was very, very cold. And in that case, not just bleaching, but we just had straight out mortality. There were inshore patch reefs that there was not a single coral left alive due to this cold water event. We're still seeing impacts from things like coastal development, pollution, sedimentation, port dredgings, ship groundings. Again, you name it, it's happening. Four to five years later, we then have another global bleaching event. We're seeing increases in the frequency of diseases and storms and bleaching events. A couple years ago, we then had Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria. And now we're basically to the point of, okay, so what's left? What are we actually working with? And now we're having a disease event that I'm gonna talk to you about today. So coral diseases, the really sad thing about coral diseases is we actually don't have that much information. They're very poorly understood and there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, there are multiple pathogens that can be involved and sometimes determining the precise or the exact pathogen that causes these diseases is very difficult. They can be bacterial, they can be viral, um, and a lot of times the difficulty in determining which pathogen is causing the disease is because Corals naturally have a very complex and diverse microbiome. So there's lots of, just like your gut, there's lots of different bacteria and things like that that naturally occur. It's just when those levels of the pathogen bloom or boom for some reason, the disease process actually starts. So it's very difficult to actually isolate the one pathogen that's causing something, sometimes because there may be more than one acting synergistically. There's also multiple vectors. Uh, lots of coral diseases are waterborne. And when you're thinking about a reef system, what are we going to do about something that's in the water? Or they can also be transmitted by contact. So we have little fish that come along and nibble on one coral and then move to another, and that's direct uh, transmission from those types of organisms. Um, so it's very, very difficult sometimes to stop a disease because there's so many interactions that are happening at the same time. 
82% of Caribbean coral species are a host to at least one disease. So even if a disease seems to only affect one species, that doesn't mean that the rest of the species aren't going to contract some type of disease. And then coral diseases also have interactive effects with other stressors. So some of these interactions here, again, you know, kind of like this list that just kind of goes on and on. So what we're seeing is uh, coral disease events can actually mimic um, other climate variations. So if you see here in this graph, anytime there's that red peak up here, which is um, actually uh, oscillation from El Nino, every time you see a red bump, you also start to see this bump in the incidence of coral diseases. Temperature can also affect both the intensity and the frequency of diseases. So as our oceans continue to warm, you see here these red dots mimic this blue dot, which is sea surface temperature. So we see higher sea surface temperatures, we see higher incidence of disease. Sedimentation can also be a problem. So coastal development or port dredgings, bee tree nourishment, things like that. This was a study done in Australia. And right around here is where the, big, the largest uh, sediment bloom occurred from this uh, dredging project. And here in these circle graphs, you can see that this was also where the highest incidence of coral disease occurred. Water quality, I mean, it makes sense. If you either have pathogens in the water or things like that, you're seeing increased uh, carbon and nitrogen in the water column, you're also seeing an increase in coral disease. Uh, just like I mentioned predation, so with overfishing, we're increasing the number of predators. The uh, coral disease or percent of coral disease increases as that number of predators increases. And with tourism, the black bars are highly visited sites, reef sites. The white bars are sites that were protected or uh, tourism is not allowed on those sites. So you can see here the mean uh, percent prevalence is significantly higher. So even just people diving or you know, accidentally touching the reef or things like that can drastically increase the amount of coral disease. Now in the Caribbean, we have the unfortunate honor of being considered a hotspot for coral disease. There's a rapid emergence of new and extremely virulent diseases here in the Caribbean. This little map here shows basically all of these dots or colors kind of show areas where coral disease is prevalent. Look here in this Caribbean box and just look at how many extra dots, extra colors are, are actually there. So we're seeing all of these diseases in the Caribbean, whereas some other places like Hawaii may only have to deal with one type of disease. Um, we're seeing here in the Caribbean uh, increased frequency of events and then the uh, rapid spread of even new diseases. 70% of all disease reports come from the Caribbean. So just to give you an idea, kind of from that color map slide to some actual numbers, if you look at the global disease prevalence, we're looking at about a mean of 3.5%. If you look in just the Caribbean, we're looking at about a mean of 3.6%. If you look in just Florida and look at those red numbers right there, our baseline is double that of the global mean. Our baseline is 6 to 13%. And if you narrow it down even more to just Key West, we're looking at almost a baseline of 28%. So you go out on a coral reef, and you're seeing reefs that have much higher coral disease prevalence. So now we get to the current disease event. In 2014, right about here, that's government cut, which goes to the Port of Miami. In 2014, a dredging project started to deepen and widen that port.
allow those PAMEX container ships to access the port. Around that same time in September of 2014, we discovered that there is a new disease event. It looked kind of like other diseases, but something wasn't quite right. It just looked different. So in 2014, you can see this red area here. That's how far that disease moved from the port of Miami in 2014. So it started going northward. Then in 2015, you saw it move a little south through Biscayne National Park, and now it's all the way up through Broward County. 2016, we're now down through halfway through the Upper Keys, and we're all the way up to Martin County. 2017, you guys can kind of see where this is going. It's reached the actual top or the uh, northern latitude of the Florida Reef Tract. We're down now through the Middle Keys. I couldn't find 2018's map, <laughs> but now that we're in 2019, we're all the way down here past Key West. We've basically, except for the Marquesas and the Dry Tortugas, we've gone through the entire reef tract. It's never happened before. We've never had a disease move through this much of the Florida reef tract. This disease has been described as stony coral tissue loss disease. And a couple of examples here of what this disease looks like in a couple of different species. Um, it's an unprecedented disease event due to the scale. So like I just said, this disease has covered the entire Florida reef tract. The number of species that this disease affects is 23. Most coral diseases affect three or four, sometimes one. So we're looking at a disease that crosses about half of the species of Caribbean coral that are found here in Florida. The duration, so most of the time a lot of coral diseases, you'll have this background of it. You know, it may never actually be gone, but this intense disease event has now been going on. We're now entering into the fifth year and the mortality from this disease we're seeing 80 to 90% mortality of all colonies that you'll find a lesion from this disease on. So here on the right, different, um, different species of coral, a lot of times you'll see, so this bright white part is probably a skeleton that was exposed, so the tissue died maybe a week ago. All of this where it's already kind of being covered by little bits of algae and things like that, you know, this progresses so very fast that depending on the size of the colony, it can actually kill an entire colony within a week to a month. So if you're having a much larger kind of colony, you may have multiple lesions pop up and it could take six months, it could take a year um, for these colonies to die. Um, but in some cases, this, this uh, disease, it stops for some reason. So you may have some living tissue left on a, on a coral. But overall, we're seeing um, 80 to 90 percent of the, of the colonies actually all die. The entire colony dies. So there is that species-specific rate of progression. Um, the two species that contract this disease first are right here. This is me and Drina and then this is Dicocinia. These are like the canaries in the coal mine. If you see one of these species with the disease lesion on a, on a reef, you know that disease is there. And then this is just a photo of um, a reef taken by Karen Neely, who works now at Nova Southeastern. And you can just see here all of these colonies that have some form of this, whether it's you know a small little lesion or it's already actually totally consumed that entire colony. So this is a very, very fast and scary disease. This is just a list of the species that are susceptible. Um, from a manager's perspective, we tried to rank them as those that were highest priority or those that were the most susceptible to this disease. So you can see this nice long list here of colonies that all very, very susceptible to this disease. We then have some species that are a little more opportunistic or more rare. So 
Sometimes we might not even know if these species were affected if you don't actually find their dead skeleton because it can just move through them so, so quickly. We also have a couple of medium priority. So these are uh, species where the disease is contracted later um, or it may not move through the colony as fast. And then we still even have some species that we're not even sure if these uh, species are affected by this or not. And this all has to do with um, lots of different reasons, whether it's the genotype, whether it's the type of the pathogen, um, the uh, susceptibility of, those, of the host, um, things like that. So there's, there's lots of reasons why this level of susceptibility can be different. Uh, in this slide, so this was actually um, data collected in 2014 at government cut, so the epicenter of where this disease started. And you can see here from these eight species, in some cases, every colony of a species that was found was affected by this disease. So the red indicates how, what percentage of those colonies were actually affected. So we're seeing 98% of 293 colonies of Meandrina were affected by this disease. Even over here in the species Solanastria that was the least affected, we still saw almost 70% of those colonies affected by this disease. So I mentioned that this has or not, this disease has different rates of progression. Um, up here is Dendrogyra, uh, the pillar coral. This colony, which was actually fairly large, took about two years for it to be totally consumed. Whereas in this uh, brain coral here, it took less than a month to almost completely and totally kill that coral. So this is some data uh, from our annual monitoring over at FWC. And what we're finding here is in some species, we're left with zero living colonies. So we're seeing almost local or site-specific extinction of some of these uh, species of coral. We're down to you know, two colonies of Copophilia. We're also drastically reducing the total number of corals. Now, these numbers are just from sites in the upper keys. So imagine if we expanded this type of data for all of the Florida Keys. And then if we added Miami or if we added Broward County, southeastern Florida, we're seeing where we're, we're seeing very, very fast declines of coral along the Florida Reef Tract. Even scarier is it's now moving throughout the Caribbean. Who didn't see that coming? So here we are in 2014, where it was first observed in Florida. Then in May of 2017, there were reports from the Cayman Islands. Fall of 2017, there were reports from Jamaica. 2018 in June, St. Martin. Puerto Rico, not Puerto Rico, that says Puerto Morales. <laughs> not Puerto Rico, uh, July 2018. And the latest uh, evidence we have is it's in the USVI, um, December 2018. I don't know if any of you saw Marilyn Brandt's talk, I guess that was last fall. Um, she touched on the disease. Um, she mostly talked about the damage from uh, hurricanes, but she also talked about the, uh, the beginning of the disease event. Now, what doesn't make sense to us, if you kind of paid attention to where these little words were popping up around the Caribbean, what doesn't really make sense to us is, well, how is it moving in that pattern? Because if you think about water currents, because we believe this disease is mostly waterborne, if you think about the water current, so we've got the loop current that comes around here to Florida, Yet and then, we've also got these little eddies that kind of happen along the Florida Keys. So that kind of makes sense. You know, it starts here in Miami, the loop current carries it up the coast, so that makes sense that it would go north. How is it moving south? It's getting caught in these little eddies, so it just kind of keeps circulating it, and then it circulates again, and then it circulates again, and we'll end up out here in the dry tortugas, 
hopefully not. Um, so that makes sense how it's moving through Florida, but then how is it getting to different places, not following any types of water current? And what I didn't point out is that all of the places where this disease is being found around the Caribbean are also where major ports are located. So we're trying to develop or try to get information on, on maybe the ship anchorages or the major ports or whether or not there's major development in the area or port dredging, things like that. But the biggest uh, idea that we have now is that the shipping containers or ships like that, whether it's ballast water or biofilm that kind of accumulates on the bottom of these ships is actually kind of transporting that disease around the Caribbean. So is there hope? I know that was like really sad and depressing, wasn't it? This is like every day I come to work and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so is there hope? None of these cute little articles deal with coral disease, but I just wanted to kind of point out that there is a lot of work going on with this disease event. This is a multi-person, multi-agency, multidisciplinary uh, effort to figure out this disease and then maybe see what we can still do about it. We haven't thrown our hands up in the air. We haven't completely given up. We are trying. And now I'm gonna kind of go through some of the ways um, that we are trying to help with this disease event. First of all, as you can imagine, there's a lot of research that goes into this. Um, first of all, we would like to be able to identify the pathogen, okay? Whether uh, using histology slides or TEM, uh, microscopy, microscopy um, trying to identify that pathogen most likely at this point, we believe it's bacterial. Um, it's again, difficult to isolate the pathogen due to that complex microbial community. Again, we think it's waterborne, but there may be the potential for there to be secondary vectors, whether it's fish, whether it's divers, um, other inverts, things like that. Um, late breaking information is that uh, the water surrounding colonies where they have disease lesions, we're finding very high levels of bacteria in the water column. That helps us kind of think that it's more waterborne. Um, there's also low levels of bacteria found in even the healthy tissue of corals, whether it's a healthy colony that maybe just hasn't shown a lesion yet or whether it's a healthy colony that may actually never develop a lesion, we are seeing low levels to increase levels of this bacteria. Um, there is the potential for there to be a secondary bacterial or viral infection, just like if you get sick, you might have a cold and then that develops into a sinus infection. It's the same thing here for corals. Then what we're also finding in some of the histology is that within the disease samples, within here, if you see, so this is the epidermis, the gastrodermis, and then this is what the disease lesion looks like in histology, in the slides for histology. They're finding some uh, things that have never been seen before, so they've been called crystalline inclusion bodies. And all within kind of this disease lesion, we're seeing vacuolated zooxanthellae along with uh, degraded coral tissue. These are all indications that, you know, the corals are degrading, there's something affecting the zooxanthellae, and now we're finding these inclusion bodies that are in two species, we found these inclusion bodies. Um, so there's still a lot of information that we need to figure out. We need to figure out what all of this means because if we figure out what all that means, maybe we can figure out a way to stop it. Since we do believe that it's bacterial, what works to get rid of bacteria? Antibiotics. Now I know that sounds very, very scary. No, we are not going out onto a reef and just dumping antibiotics into the water. Um, but we are in lab and field trials trying out some antibiotic treatments. Um, 
This is an example of on one of the Dendrogyra colonies, they're actually um, cutting a trench into the skeleton and then applying an antibiotic treatment to the lesion itself. We're using things like amoxicillin, uh, canamycin, and ampicillin, either separately or in combination. They're also using things like triple antibiotic or like neosporin cream. They're even trying to tr uh, use chlorine powder as a disinfectant. Um, maybe, you know, we don't want to be using antibiotics, but something like a chlorine powder, like you could wipe off the surface with chlorine or with bleach, something like that. Um, this is actually a really cool project that I wanted to bring up. Um, we are using Force Blue, which is a group of veterans that are very interested in trying to make a difference. They're all very skilled divers. Um, they are doing a lot of these intervention treatments along with uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I just thought it was super awesome to, to point out that there are a lot of people involved in this effort. But you can see here they're actually applying this cream to the coral to try to stop the advancement of that lesion. Um, this is a lab trial here that shows um, in some cases, so this is Montastria cavernosa, in some cases applying antibiotics actually stops the progression of that lesion. This here shows that trenching and then this was chlorinated epoxy that was put on it. And you can see how the disease has not progressed past that line. So we are still trying these processes. Unfortunately, we're getting mixed success. Um, we're not really seeing super high levels of success, whether it's in the uh, antibiotic treatment or the chlorine treatment. So these are percent failures. And you can see the difference there between the lab trials and then uh, the field trials. But in my mind, any success is good success. We just have to figure out how to increase the number of corals we can treat and figure out logistically how we can make this feasible. Uh, we also have a team of people working with like restoration. There's lots of restoration going on around the Caribbean, mostly with staghorn and elkhorn coral, which I don't know if you guys notice, but um, those are two species that don't actually seem to be affected by this disease event. For once, a Acropora isn't the problem child. But there's lots of restoration happening around the Caribbean, mostly with the Acroporids, but we're also starting to do a lot of restoration with massive corals, with Orbicella and with Montastria, with the Deplorias and the Pseudodeplorias. So now we're kind of getting into this, what do we do stage? Because how do you know when to start restoring a reef when this type of disease event has been moving through? For example, up here in Miami-Dade, that disease has been there since 2014. So do we want to put a lot of energy and effort into doing restoration if those corals are just going to maybe die as soon as we put them out? Or is now the time when we should be doing it? Um, because we do really need to start restoring these reefs and getting them to a more ecologically uh, healthy state. So how do we minimize those risks? And this is a really big question um, that we have a team of people that are uh, working very hard to figure out when can we start restoring our reefs. So here at uh, Moat Marine Lab and actually a lot of other places around uh, Florida and the Caribbean, these are just examples of um, so some micro frags that they've created uh, so this is Orbicella. So they have all of these corals ready to go. It was actually very unfortunate that this disease event happened when it did because Moat was ready to just start out planting coral. And then we had to say, wait a minute, we need to understand what's going to happen with this disease event before you just put all these corals out there. We don't want them to serve as a vector to then have this disease flare back up. Um, 
So they're actually starting to do some restoration trial or pilot projects to see how quickly those corals might uh, show evidence of, the, of this disease and then how they uh, might affect the rest of restoration. That's basically what I just talked about. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, so we don't want to increase the pathogen load. We don't want to cause this disease to flare back up. We don't want to enhance the spread. And we don't want really all of this hard work that everyone's been doing to grow these corals. We don't want them to just die. So still lots of work to be done with that. Coral rescue um, is the last uh, kind of technique that we're trying to use in order to do something beneficial from this disease event. Um, I am part of this coral rescue team. Um, and again, it is a multi-agency, multi-disciplinary -discipl effort to collect colonies of corals that are susceptible to this disease and then hold them in captivity to preserve their genetic diversity to then use in future propagation and restoration efforts. Never would I have thought that I would be standing up here saying, hey, we're going to collect a bunch of corals, stick them in aquariums, and then everything's going to be great. <laughs> um, that's not quite what we're doing, but it sounds like that's what we're doing. We are. We're collecting corals from in front of the disease margin, holding them in captivity. We're going to breed those corals, and then we're going to plant healthy corals back on the reef when hopefully it's safe to do so. So for that process, there has been a lot of work and a lot of thought that's gone into this process. We realize that this is something that's never been done before. We realize that we are on a very steep learning curve right now. Um, but this is just hopefully one tool in the toolbox. Um, so we have developed collection plans, and I'll go a little bit more into that in a minute. Um, collection plans, transport plans. How are we going to get all of these corals, and where are we going to put them? Um, maintenance and care plans. A lot of these species have not really been held in captivity before. We don't even know how to take care of them. Um, so we're developing maintenance and care plans. We're also very worried about biosecurity. We want to know that tanks that might have held an Indo-Pacific species won't affect or is you know, completely and totally disinfected so that when we put these Caribbean corals in there, there's nothing that can go wrong. Um, so biosecurity is very, very important. And we have lots of uh, vets and scientists working on that as well to make sure that we are doing this appropriately. We're not just going out there and collecting whatever we want. So some examples of some of the collection and transport. We are collecting colonies um, that are 10 to 30 centimeters in max diameter. And we are hand collecting them with a hammer and chisel. We want to do the least amount of damage to the surrounding reef substrate as possible. We are tagging and doing uh, photographs for all of these colonies. We're recording as much information as we can for each one. We then transport them by truck to Keys Marine Lab, where they're kind of, um, it's one of our little intermediate holding facilities. So here are some of the corals in one of the tanks at uh, Keys Marine Lab. And then for coral care and biosecurity, uh, Lots of different processes happen. First of all, we cut off any dead skeleton or any uh, skeleton where other organisms like macroalgae or sponges, things like that, uh, make contact with coral. We want it to be as healthy as possible. We then sometimes mount this coral. So if any of the cor live coral tissue touches the side of a tank, the bottom of a tank, anything like that, we'll actually mount them onto little tiles so that all of the tissue isn't, none of the tissue is irritated at all. They're on a very strict diet. <laughs> uh, they are fed twice a week so that they get nice and fat and happy. 
all of the tanks are cleaned. We even go and we collect herbivores to help keep these tanks clean so that they can also then munch away some of the competing organisms that are in these tanks. So this is a part-time job for some, full-time job for others, and we had no idea what we were getting into. But that's also why we have this coral rescue team to try and think about all of those other things. So we have identified land-based facilities that are going to take and house these corals. They are uh, going to um, hold these corals in Florida as well as throughout the United States. So the facilities in Florida are the Florida Aquarium, Keys Marine Lab, Nova Southeastern, Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota, and then University of Miami. Um, we also are uh, determining long-term facilities, such as um, aquariums that are part of the Association of Zoos and Aquarium. We're talking about aquariums in Nebraska, Chicago, all around the United States. So this is actually a huge, huge effort. Again, like I said, um, a lot of these corals have not even been held in captivity before. So we are developing genetic markers so that we can genotype all of these corals and get as much genetic information from this effort as possible. All of those corals will be genotyped and then that information will be held in a database. It'll be managed by uh, FWC. I mentioned earlier propagation and breeding programs. I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, then once we feel conditions are good enough that these corals may be returned, we are then uh, planning to put a lot of those corals into field-based nurseries. We have a lot of them here in Florida and hopefully other places around the Caribbean can do the same. Then there's the reintroduction and restoration. And then of course, there's gonna be a lot of monitoring that follows along with this. So the coral rescue plan is to target disease-free sites um, in the lower keys, even though we're almost out of space here in the lower keys, um, and the Marquesas, as well as the dry tortugas. Um, we plan to collect 100 colonies per species. We have 15 high priority and six medium priority target species. So 15 times 21, no, 200 times 21 is 4,200 corals. And we're setting a minimum, a minimum target of 50 unique genotypes. Um, that number is based on the FWC plan for genetic restoration. We need to know that we are collecting genetically diverse colonies so that we, when we then propagate and breed them, we're actually going to increase the genetic diversity. So hopefully we'll end up with more than we started with, and that's going to be very, very important for then the natural recovery um, of, these, of these coral species. This is actually a photo from two weeks ago. These are corals that were taken from McKee's Marine Lab and put at uh, Flora Aquarium, their Center for Conservation on Apollo Beach. Um, this was the first effort to actually, from Keys Marine Lab, then move them somewhere else. And these were the happiest, fattest corals I've ever seen. Um, I wish I had been back on the reefs back in the 60s when this is just what a reef looked like. You know, all of these nice, healthy, dark colored corals, but too late for that now. So kind of talking again about that, the need for genetic diversity, um, we're really hoping that maybe there's something in the genes of these corals that allow some disease resistance to build up we have evidence that there is genetic resistance to things like coral bleaching. So hopefully there's something we can learn about disease uh, resistance as well. Increasing the genetic diversity uh, then could also increase the resistance to future disease or stress. Um, and then by out planting multiple genotypes at all of our sites, we would then decrease the chance of catastrophe. That basically means if one reef gets wiped out, we haven't lost everything. 
So for the propagation and breeding in captivity, um, there's lots of coral. So, you know, I've basically told you that we're down to next to nothing as far as our coral reefs go. So a lot of our Caribbean coral species are genetically depauperate. That means, you know, there's, there's not a lot of genetic diversity out there. Um, most restoration today focuses on asexual reproduction. So fragments, that microfragging or taking branches and breaking them up. That doesn't increase genetic diversity. So we need these corals to spawn and sexually reproduce and create new genotypes. So the idea, and they're actually starting this process at Florida Aquarium, they are inducing spawning in captive corals and then cross-fertilizing those corals to create new genotypes. And then that would increase the genetic diversity available for restoration. So to this point, we have done two pilot collections. We collected from six disease-free sites. You can't really see them because they're dark, but these are the sites that we collected from in the Florida Keys. Back when we did these in September and October of last year, we actually had a lot more real estate that we could choose from. Now we're down to about right there. So these four sites now actually have disease. So we actually have corals from these sites that we can start using for propagation. Um, we did six to eight colonies per species. We targeted 12 uh, species and we collected a total of 177 corals. Those corals were housed at Keys Marine Lab until December 19th of last year when 90 corals were then moved to the Florida Aquarium. 99% um, of those rescue corals are actually still alive and doing well at some point. We do have some in quarantine, um, but they are in quarantine because they've developed lesions of some kind, not because they've developed the, the disease. They've just either had interactions with like the tank or, or other issues like that. Or one species, uh, Eusmilia, just doesn't really seem to like to be held in captivity. So again, lots of learning going on um, to this point date what we are doing now. Um, we are extracting all of that DNA to develop those genetic markers. We are prepping facilities or have facilities uh, getting ready to hold corals. The next place that's going to be able to take corals um, is Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota. They can take corals in two weeks. So rescue is going to really ramp up again in two weeks. This says awaiting funding, but yesterday afternoon, we actually found out that our next funding source came through. So we have money to do this now. <laughs> and so basically we're ready to start this, this rescue process. Um, I have a lot of anxiety about this for some reason. <laughs> um, but you know, again, here, this is just the collection process. So we're ready to just go out there. Um, we've got a huge, field crew that's ready to go. Um, so yeah, we're just, we're just ready to do this. Uh, there are probably 50 to 60 organizations that aren't even on this slide, but I just wanted to show the amazing number of organizations that are involved in this disease response, everywhere from the histology to data management to um, developing outreach materials, to the research, just everything. This has just been, it's all hands on deck and everybody's just working as hard as they absolutely can trying to make a difference. Um, so I really have to applaud them and I can take none of the credit. <laughs> so with that, um, most of our funding for the Coral Rescue alone is uh, from the state, Fish and Wildlife, from NOAA, and then our next round of funding for Coral Rescue is from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, I have my email address up here. I welcome any questions in the future that you guys might have. Please contact me as, as often as you'd like. Um, and with that, I'll actually take any questions that you might have right now.